So when we last left off, the vertebrate amniotes had just barged their way in to establish themselves above the monstrous arthropods. So let's take a look at how they got on, as well as how life faced its biggest challenge in Earth's history so far. So after the Carboniferous rainforest collapse and the formation of Pangaea, the Carboniferous came to a close and the Permian period began 298.9 million years ago. First introduced to the world in 1841 by Sir Roderick Murchison, who studied these rock units around the Ural Mountains and named the period after the nearby city of Perm. However, it wasn't until 1941 that it was universally agreed that these rock units weren't just subsections of the Carboniferous. So what exactly did planet Earth look like at this time? Well, as already stated, all of the continents had conjoined into one giant landmass called Pangaea. Because of the placement and the shape of the supercontinent, Earth had two oceans, the Panthalassa Ocean and the Paleotethes Ocean, which was a semi-inland sea in between Gondwana and Asia. Speaking of the sea, its levels seem actually fairly stable for the first half, but halfway through the Permian period, sea levels dropped off sharply to their lowest levels in the entire Paleozoic. Given the single landmass, walking around during this time as a Permian animal would have met you with a homogenised site across all of the land. The world at this time experienced a lot of continental climate, which is where we see extreme variations between hot and cold, depending on the season since the ocean isn't really close enough to regulate much of the land. Despite this, global mean temperatures were actually relatively cool, but things were excessively dry. Most inland localities were dry desert environments, being as uninhabitable as many deserts today, with bacon hot days and frigidly cold nights. The seasons were characteristically extreme with regards to aridity too, with excessively dry winters and extreme monsoons during the summer. So with such a characterising climate, the life at this time was bound to be pretty special as well. Whilst the Permian conjures thoughts of dry deserts inhabited by diverse reptiles, the marine biota was equally as rich. They were finally picking themselves up from the Devonian extinction, and the oceans were rich in various ammonites, echinoderms, brachiopods and mollusks. Trilobites also underwent a diversification event during the early Permian, but this was the last in their story, foreshadowing what was on the horizon. The chondrichthys were also doing pretty good as well, with utter weirdos like the buzz sawtooth shark, Helicoprion. Land, however, that turf war was starting to change tides. Despite the Carboniferous rainforest collapse, Flora managed to bounce back by changing tactics. Remember, because of the formation of Pangaea, much of the inland areas of the continent was excessively dry, which isn't really conducive for plants. The lycosid dominated forests and swamps of the Carboniferous were eventually replaced with diversified plant life that had adapted into four distinct regions. The Gondwanan, the Angaran, the Carthasian and the Euro-American regions. The lycopsids were mostly limited to the Carthasian and Angaran regions, with the Euro-American region seeing most of those tree ferns and Gondwanan regions having woody glossopteridales in wet peatlands. So let's now move on to the actual animals that inhabited these plant regions, since I hear they're more exciting. Now remember that the arthropods had just had their cornflakes shut in by those annoying reptiles, since they could now challenge for niches thanks to evolving less dependency on water. But this isn't to say that they were doing badly. In fact, insects in particular saw a massive increase in diversity in the early Permian, with the dominant groups being the Paleoptera, Palineoptera, and Paraneoptera. But alas, it was the tetrapod's time to shine. Whilst amphibians had already had their day, amniotes, which are vertebrates who are able to retain moisture in their body and eggs allowing for birth on land, were thriving. Now, as already stated in the Carboniferous video, this group had split into two. The Seropsids, which is a group that would remain to become all subsequent reptiles, 
and the synapsids, a group that were more or less reptiles at first, but the key difference being a single temporal fenestra in their skull. Now, though they were more or less reptiles at the time, they did have another key difference with the seropsids in that they could actually pee. No, really. Now, if you're a bit weird and want to find out why reptiles such as dinosaurs have never peed, you can check out that video here. Ultimately, during the Permian though, it was these synapsid reptiles that took the top dog niches, limiting the seropsids to being small insectivores. So they did give us the earliest known vertebrate to glide. At first you had the pelicosaurs, which is now considered an informal term, and they were acting as much of America's and Europe's hyperherbivores and apex predators, with the poster child pelicosaur being Dimetrodon. That's right, this guy lived, breathed and died long before dinosaurs were even a thing. So the next time you are in a shop and you see this guy in a box of dinosaur toys, pick up that box and throw it across the shop. Then yell profanities at the poor, innocent 19-year-old part-time employee there who's only working there on a Saturday to get through their degree. Like any sane person would. Now it does actually go further than that though. Feel the side of your face. I'm not being weird, just, just, just do it. Now you can feel your cheekbone ridge, which just above that you have your temple, which you can feel tense up when you clench your teeth. Now that muscle feeds underneath that bony ridge in order to close your jaw. And that hole is your single temporal fenestra. You see, synapsids are still around today, but they're no longer even remotely reptile-like. They became mammals. Dimetrodon is actually more closely related to us than it is to any dinosaur. Now this point is only made more clear when we look at the quote-unquote more advanced synapsids known as therapsids, which includes the famous gorgonopsids. A lot of sids. Now these therapsids were actually what came to eventually replace the pelicosaurs by the mid-Permian, though it's still unclear as to how this happened, whether it represents a gap in the fossil record or a minor extinction event, but many have taken to calling it Olsen's Gap. Come the late Permian, ancestors of many modern vertebrates had evolved alongside these therapsids. One group of small therapsid had evolved alongside the carnivorous gorgonopsids and herbivorous dicarnodonts, called the cynodonts. And it was these guys that were mammals' true, direct ancestors. Along with them, you also had a group of seropsids develop called archosaurs. Now, you wouldn't know it at this point, but this was a group destined to inherit the Earth for the next era. Now, I don't want to spoil my next episode in this series, so you'll just have to wait to see it. Maybe subscribe so you don't miss it. So, Life on Earth was now beginning to show some more modern variations, which means there can't be much on the horizon that can change that. Right? Wrong. So... So wrong. Now, the Permian period did end with an extinction event, but this event was unlike any other before it. Hell, it was unlike any after it. This was the PT mass extinction event, or as it's more informally called, the Great Dying. Now, if you've ever felt bad for the dinosaurs, this made that apocalypse look like a bar fire on a stag do in Magaluf. 251.9 million years ago, roughly 98 percent of life was completely wiped out. You heard me right. Life on planet Earth was just 2% away from starting all over again as it had done billions of years ago. So something clearly went down here, but as to what remained a complete and utter mystery up until about 10 to 15 years ago when a few hypotheses started to crop up. And the generally accepted theory is the exact reason why we should probably be talking about this event more often. But before we get to the cause, let's take a look at the effects. You can now bid farewell and part ways with groups such as the Eurypterids and Trilobite, as they are never heard from again. And other groups like Ammonites, Gastropods, Brachiopods and Crinoids were barely hanging on by a thread. 
Vertebrates didn't really fare much better either, with the Acanthodians disappearing completely and many others doing barely better than the invertebrates. On the land, everything was suffering too. To date, this is still the only real mass extinction that terrestrial arthropods have been through. Groups that superficially resembled their modern counterparts were wiped out and they haven't really changed too much since. When it comes to the terrestrial vertebrates, they fared much worse. Just over two thirds of groups completely disappeared, with only the odd group of amphibian, reptile and proto-mammal barely clinging on to carry on the lineages. Herbivores were especially hit hard and come the end of the event, if you were lucky enough to see a land vertebrate, it was likely a Lystrosaurus. Now tetrapods especially took a really long time to recover from this, since their diversity doesn't actually reach normal levels for a staggering 30 million years after this event. Even the plant life suffered. Flora doesn't fossilise quite as readily, so a lack of it doesn't necessarily mean that they were in trouble. But there is a sudden massive change in the groups we see from this point onwards, so they must have been affected too. In short, things were not looking great. Planet Earth looked like a barren, filthy, post-apocalyptic wasteland. Or Baz Vegas at 5am on a Sunday. <laughs> it's going to be about 2% of people that actually get that reference. Maybe even that. But what actually caused this? Well, we're still not 100% sure as surface rocks normally subduct every 200 million years or so and this event happened just over 250 million years ago. But we do have a good enough idea of what went down. Way, way up north there is an igneous complex known as the Siberian Traps. Here you'll see around 2 million square miles of basaltic rock having cooled down from lava. Now this lava wasn't exploding from volcanoes, rather it was overflowing gradually over a very long period at the end of the Permian. In fact, it's estimated that this took place over the course of roughly two million years, meaning this field was growing by a square mile every year. And with that volume of lava, it is the largest basaltic event to ever happen in Earth's history. And a byproduct of basaltic lava, our good old friend carbon. From this event, massive amounts of carbon would have been released over the course of 2 million years, causing a severe greenhouse effect and spilling into the oceans, affecting the delicate carbon ratio that so much marine life is dependent on, explaining much of the ocean anoxia that we see from this time. This destroyed the marine life through chemical imbalances, decimated the plant life that the herbivores were so reliant on, affecting the carnivores that fed on them. Essentially, global food chains completely broke down. So carbon dioxide causing massive amounts of climate change and extreme extinctions. Sound familiar? Now events like this, I think, really hit home the severity of our current situation. Now if you don't think that we're in the midst of a mass extinction event, Remember that mass extinctions take place over hundreds to thousands and sometimes millions of years. Now we've only been affecting the planet at this disastrous rate for around 200 years. And in that time, the same amount of species have gone extinct and carbon released as what would have happened over a thousand years or so naturally, which is in a geological instant. It's not always the change that causes the extinction. It's the speed at which it happens, outpacing life's ability to adapt. Now, considering that two million years of gradual change brought life to its knees and nearly wiped it out completely, the thought of that happening in a fraction of the time is terrifying. All jokes aside, I really don't think life will bounce back if this continues. But hopefully planet Earth will last long enough for me to catch you guys next time.